Iblis, the accursed devil. Iblis has a very interesting story. Iblis has free will. The mankind and jinn have free will. They have the ability to decide whether or not they want to do right or wrong. Not every jinn is a shaitan. Jinn is a creation like us and there are Muslim jinn, there are righteous jinn, there are good jinn, worshipping jinn, and there are also evil jinn. And the evil jinn are called shayateen. The angels, the malaika on the other hand, were created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't have a choice. They weren't built with the innate ability to choose should I or should I not. Their goal, their mission in life is to praise and worship God alone. But Iblis, interestingly enough, used to be one of the highest worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a superstar. He was incredible. Iblis was a worshipper. He was an abid. And it was interesting to note that because of his ability to choose, if he makes the right decision, he gets more points. The angels don't have a choice. All the actions they do, that's how they're built. But if someone has the choice to do right or wrong and they choose the right, that's plus points for them. So Iblis used to hang out with the angels because the angels are the top of praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Iblis was so good that he was able to kick it with the angels. And one moment in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled his plan in the Loh al-Mahfud to create our father, Adam alayhi To create our father, the first of all the prophets, the first of all mankind, Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled this plan. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, he created Adam out of mud. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam in stages. And one of the stages that Adam was at before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blew the soul of Adam into the, into Adam, Adam was like a statue. That's one of the stages. Allah created him out of mud and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept him an empty statue. A figure of a human being from the outside, empty from the inside. Now obviously Iblis was jealous from the moment he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be creating a better creation than him. So what Iblis started to do, he started to get into the nose of Adam, come down, come out of his bottom, go from his ear, go through the other ear, Wherever there is openings, he used to enter it and come out. The hadith says, when Iblis saw Adam empty from inside, he said, Iblis knew from his experience that when he saw Adam empty from the inside, he knew that this creation of Allah is an easy influence creation. He's an easy influence creation. Ali cannot grab himself on his desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created Adam and he said to bow. He commanded the malaika in the Quran, he says, he commanded them all to bow. Illa Iblis. And they all bowed except for Iblis. You might be saying, well, Allah says, well, and I said to the angels, but Iblis wasn't an angel. But like we said before, because he was at that level of the angels, he's included in that group. They all bowed except for Iblis. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Iblis, Why have you not done what I have commanded you to do? Why haven't you bowed to Adam when I told you to bow? By the way, this sajda was not of worship. It wasn't a sajda of ibadah. It was a sajda of respect. And so he commanded him. So Iblis said, No. He said, I'm better than him. I'm better than him. You created me from fire and you made him from clay. The first instance of racism ever to have existed on this earth. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that his logic was actually wrong, okay? Which is, he argued that fire was better than clay. He actually goes and writes an entire book about why clay is better than fire. <laughs> so he starts to go through all of these different reasons, things that you would never even imagine. He starts to go through how clay can bear nutrients, how it's mixed with beneficial things, and the purity of clay and so on and so forth. But the main thing that he says, which is very beautiful, he says that clay is used to build while fire is used to destroy. SubhanAllah. The original purpose of Adam alayhi salam, why he sent to this earth, why human beings are sent to this earth is what? Isti'ma, to build. And clay is used to build and things that are like clay are used to build. Whereas fire can't build anything, fire only destroys. So clay is actually superior to fire, SubhanAllah. So the idea here, number one, is that most likely you only deceive yourself when you use logic over revelation. You're going to only ruin yourself. And again, that doesn't mean understanding the context of revelation, which shows us that our faith is indeed an intellectual one and that the revelation coincides with logic, you know, almost all the time. But the second thing is that his logic was also faulty. Iblis said, I'm better than him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, because imagine, can you imagine this? We read this story like it's folk tales. Imagine disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly to his face, Jalla wa ala. Shaitan is literally in the presence of God and he says no. He refuses to make sajda and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
tells him to leave paradise, leave the gathering of the angels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is in Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 13, Allah says, قَالَ فَهَبِطْ مِنْهَا فَمَا يَكُونُ لَكَ أَن تَتَكَبَّرَ فِيهَا Allah says, descend from it. يعني, get out, get out from this gathering. فَمَا يَكُونُ لَكَ أَن تَتَكَبَّرَ فِيهَا It is not for you to be arrogant here. Arrogance takes a person away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this case, even physically a person is distanced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is kicked out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna kamin الصَّاغِرِينَ So exit from it. Indeed, you are amongst those who are debased. Interesting thing happens next. Shaitan says, he turns to, he's, you know, he raises his, his hands or he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes a request. What do we call a request in Arabic language? When someone makes a request to Allah, we call that a dua, right? He makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, make me amongst the mundirin or give me, give me life until the day of resurrection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qala innaka min al You get what you want. What is happening here is that, and this is actually amazing, because one of the tricks of shaitan is to come to a person who is sinful, who is far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to convince them that they have no hope. That you're just too sinful for Allah to forgive you. You're too sinful for Allah to accept your repentance. You are this and you are that. Don't even bother. But for himself, he knew, even though he directly refused the commandment of Allah. And Allah said that he is amongst the disbelievers. Allah kicked him out of paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even said it. وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ لَعْنَةِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الدين. Upon your is my la'na, my curse upon the day of res- until the day of resurrection. Even with that, he turned around and said, قَالَ رَبِّي فَأَنذِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يبعثون. He said, my Lord, give me respite until the day on which they are resurrected. Because he knows that no matter how sinful you are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will number one forgive you and he can answer your du'a. And yet it's so ironic that he uses this very tactic again. He convinces us that we're too sinful for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our du'a. And actually, Allah answers his du'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الْمُنذَرِينَ Allah says, you are amongst those who have been given respite. Why is it? That when Allah answers his dua, he says, Oh my Lord, allow me to live until the day of uh, judgment. That Allah says, You are amongst those who have been given respite. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, You have been given respite? Right? What's the wisdom behind that? And one of the things that the Mufassirun, they mention, is that Allah here mentions a category of people. A category of people who have a similar fate to Iblis. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows them to live because Allah doesn't punish anyone unjustly. So in order for this person to be punished, they will live out their life and increase themselves in sins. So actually, allowing Iblis to live is a form of punishment for him. Because the longer he lives, the more sins he will accumulate, and the more he will be held accountable for the Day of Judgment, and the more he'll be punished. Amongst mankind, there are people who are very similar to this. You know, people often ask the question, they say, why is it that God would allow a tyrant to live? Right? Somebody who murders people, kills innocent women and children, and Allah just allows him to live? I mean, sometimes people say like, man, he's 80 years old, like when is he gonna die? Like, khandisna minhu, like we're done with it, please. Like, Allah, take his life, right? And a person may say, how is it fair that God allows this tyrant to live, yet Allah took the life of a young child, right? Just because you don't understand the wisdom behind that, doesn't mean there isn't wisdom. One of the wisdoms is that Allah allows that tyrant to live as a form of punishment. Because the longer he stays alive, or she stays alive, the more they will have to be accountable for. And Iblis actually has the longest life. We know he's gonna be alive until the day of resurrection. Hence, he will have the, amongst the worst punishment in the Akhirah. And then he starts making threats. He says, I swear by the error that you have put me in. Who is the you here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's telling Allah, Oh Allah, I swear by the error that you have put me in. He said, I will sit and wait for them upon your straight path. And then shaitan, after this, shaitan tells Allah, you know this creation that you created? These human beings? The ones that I'm better than? He says, ثُمَّ لَآتَيْنَاهُمْ he says, verily, I'm going to come to them. Min baini aidihim. 
in translations, min bayni aidihim is translated as in front of them. But this is an incorrect translation. Min bayni aidihim means from between their hands. Someone can stand in front of you and it's not offensive. Someone can stand at a healthy distance in front of you and you will feel comfortable. But if someone gets between your hands, that's grounds for a fight. That's serious. Like back off, I don't know you that much, right? So shaitan is threatening us. Innahu lakum adubun mubin. Verily to you, he's, a, he's an enemy. He's a clear enemy. He's threatening each and every one of you. He says, I'm going to get in your face. Min bayni aidihim. Wa min khalfihim and behind them. Wa'an aymanihim wa'an shama'ilihim. He says, and, on, and from behind them and on the right and on their left. And then he makes the challenge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Wala tajidu aksaruhum shakirin. And, O oh Allah, you will not find a lot of them will be grateful to you. This is the method by which shaitan is going to attack us. He already laid it out for us. He told us that his goal is to make us not grateful. His goal is to make us reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings by not being grateful to him. What are some of the tactics of shaitan? One of the, the most effective tactics of shaitan, one of the most powerful tools of shaitan is in fact the very reality that we don't know and we're not conscious of shaitan. It's like if, you know, if, if a robber wants to come into your house, that robber's greatest strength is the fact that you're completely unaware. That you're completely unaware of his presence and of his tactics. In fact, you don't even know that he exists in reality. You don't acknowledge his existence. And that makes the robber super effective because he can come in and out, you don't even realize it. I am also not talking about the other extreme where we sometimes become obsessed with these kinds of things and we miss the point. Let's find a healthy balance. And that healthy balance is yes, shaitan exists. Yes, jinn exists. Yes, the shayateen are real. Yes, their influence is real. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala akbar. Okay, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than everything else. And that he includes the shaitan and his army. Allah is greater than all of them. So what I want us to do is while we are aware of our enemy and while we are aware that we are in a battlefield, we should also be aware of who's in charge at the end of the day. Okay, even if the entire world, as Allah tells us, even if the entire world were to gather together to harm you with something, they could not harm you except by what Allah has written for you. And if the entire world had come together to benefit you with something, they could not benefit you except in what Allah has written for you. Of the simple tactics of shaitan is the tactic to cause us to forget, to cause us to neglect. And this is, alhamdulillah, we thank Allah that if shaitan succeeds, we are not held accountable. So of the tactics of shaitan is he causes us to not think about our timing of salah. We don't realize it's time to pray. That we don't realize, for example, we can sometimes oversleep even though we wanted to wake up. Shaitan might help us in extending that sleep. We don't wake up at all. Anytime this happens, it is from shaitan. Once in the lifetime of the process and he over slept Fajr and he overslept Fajr because it was the battle the day before and the army was tired they went to sleep late at night he stationed Bilal to wake them up for Fajr and Bilal himself fell asleep and the whole army overslept Fajr their excuse by the way was jihad the previous day their excuse wasn't watching a film the previous day it was doing jihad the previous day so if there is any excuse then that is that excuse the process and woke up and said this is an area where shaitan so and so is we will move somewhere else and he blamed it on shaitan so shaitan kind of sort of helped them persist in that sleep or it caused them to forget so that tactic of shaitan even though it is effective in the sense that we don't do the good deed we will not be held accountable and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will overlook and forgive by the way the role of shaitan the the role and purpose of shaitan the focus of shaitan the goal of shaitan can actually be carried out by both jinn and ins so that's why when I say jinn and ins I'm talking about jinn and I'm talking about human beings you know in Surah An-Nas, when we ask for protection by Allah, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by Allah from the shayateen, we say, min sharil waswas al khannas. We ask for protection from al waswas, the one who whispers and then retreats. Put the idea in your head and then, you know, hides in the corner. And, and makes you think it was your idea. Makes you think that it's actually you who thinks that. But he is whispering, that's why he whispers and then he retreats. He whispers and then he hides, so that you think it's you. And you start to think there's something wrong with you. Um, but these are, we have to understand that there's an external source of whispering. It's not even you. But he whispers and he retreats. Min al jinnati wan nas. So this is from jinn and people. We have to be aware that there are people who actually are carry out and help in the mission of shaitan. And that whispering that we ask protection from Allah, by Allah from, is from both jinn and ins, from both jinn and human beings. In this hadith in Sahih Muslim, our Prophet said, 
towards the end of times people will come that du'atun ala abwabi jahannam they are da'is calling but not to Allah ala abwabi jahannam they're calling to jahannam and he said that shayateen fi surat al-insan they are human shayateen the hadith literally calls them these are people they are human shayateen that these are people they are of our flesh and blood but they are the equivalent of the shayateen amongst men now these people they are are those whose entire lives is dedicated to fitna and fasad to build to bringing filth and misguiding others now the shaitan he's so devoted to his mission the mission that the sheikh talked about the mission of attacking us on the straight path the mission of coming at us from the front and from the back and from the right and from the left he's got nothing else to do so what we have to realize is we have a very skilled opponent but but that opponent also is not undefeatable Notice in the ayah something important. The shaitan says that I will attack them on where? He doesn't say I'll, I'll attack them outside the nightclub, right? He doesn't say I'll attack them, you know, in, the, in Vegas while they're gambling. He says I'll attack them on your straight path. You see where he's attacking? He's going to put in more effort to attack those who are trying to be on the straight path. Because it, it, that's where you require more energy. If someone's already off the path, it doesn't take as much energy to misguide them, right? It doesn't take as much energy, as much focus, as much army to get them off the path. So he, he in fact will put, put in more attacks and more skilled and more mind games and just more effort on those who are are actually trying to be on the straight path and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us allah says and thus we have made for every prophet every prophet dealt with this situation every prophet dealt with the situation of an enemy from jinn and mankind the shayateen from jinn and mankind and we know in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when describing the shaytan doesn't use light terminology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the shaytan as our enemy. And I know when we think of the term enemy, we may think of someone who like hates us or someone who doesn't like us or someone who intends bad for us or evil for us. But we may even look at uh, people who are oppressive towards Muslims or towards mankind. And we, like, we may think of that person as our enemy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that before any of those people who have ill will towards us, anyone in the world who wants to harm us and to bring us pain and all of that, there is an enemy on top of all of those enemies, and that is the shaytan. Inna shaytana lakum adu. Allah says that the shaytan is most certainly an enemy for you. That is the hadith of Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha. Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says one night, I went to go visit the Prophet as he was making i'tikaf in the masjid, meaning he was spending the night in the masjid to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She says, I went to go visit him. Now this is the wife of the Prophet She spent some time with him in the masjid. And as a couple hours, some time goes by, she's, you know, she's done visiting him and now she wants to go home. And the Prophet tells her that he will walk her home. He will accompany her back to the house. It's like the middle of the night now. And so they now leave the masjid. They're walking now. This is the streets of Medina. It's the middle of the night. It's dark and all that. And they come across, they see two men. And Sophia, she actually said there were two Ansari men. She says, we see two Ansari men. And as soon as they see us, they begin to walk quickly. So they basically make eye contact and they're like, oops. And they begin to like walk away really quickly. And then the Prophet, him, he begins to say out loud, Hadihi Sophia. هَذِهِ أُمُّكُمْ هَذِهِ صَفِيَّ بِنْ حُيَيْهِ The Prophet begins to say out loud, This is Safiya. This is your mother. As we know, the, the wives of the Prophet are mothers of the believers. He says, this is your mother. This is, and then he identifies exactly who she is. He says, this is Safiya, the daughter of Huyay. And the men begin to say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Ya Rasulullah, Subhanallah, Ya Rasulullah. You know, people read this hadith and they're like, why are they saying Subhanallah? What's going on here? Let me tell you what's going on here. What happens is, what happens is, the, is that when the Prophet identified her, they begin to say, Subhanallah, Ya Rasulullah. What they're saying is, Subhanallah, O Messenger of Allah, we would never think that you're out in the middle of the night with a woman that is not related to you, that is not your mahram. Right? And they're saying, Subhanallah, we, that's not what we were thinking. And then the Prophet he replies to them. He said, Inna shaytan yajri min al insan majrad dam. He says, most certainly the shaitan flows through man like the flowing of blood. 
He said, Inni khashit. He said, I feared that the shaitan would put an evil thought, su'a, put an evil, a bad thought into your hearts. Right? So, you know, people read this narration and they often pose the question. Some people are afraid to pose a question. But they're like, well, why didn't the Prophet send them give those two companions? And yes, they were companions. They were from the Ansar, right? noble companions. Why didn't the Prophet give them the benefit of the doubt? Right? Why didn't he say, to, why, didn't he, why did he assume that they may think that he is doing something bad? That he's out in the, this is the best of Allah, so I said, right? That he's out in the middle of the night with a woman that he's not related to. And in actuality, if you really look at this hadith, what you realize is that the Prophet was actually giving them the benefit of the doubt. Because what he's saying here is, in essence, that I don't fear that you would have a bad thought about me. What I fear is that the shaitan would put a bad thought into your hearts. And so now by informing the companions of the presence of shaitan, he is teaching them how to protect themselves. He is teaching them that in a moment like that, it is very important to be aware of shaitan so you can fight those whisperings of shaitan. Because shaitan flows through mankind just like the flowing of blood. فَدَلَّهُمَا بِغُرُورٍ Allah Azza wa Jalla is describing what, how shaitan got our parents, Adam and Hawa alayhima, to make the mistake that they made. What was his strategy to get them to listen to him? Not just what he said to them, we all know that he whispered to them. He lied to our father Adam. He lied to him straight to his face. And he said, Allah has told you to not eat of this tree because Allah did not want to give you everlasting life. We all know that he offered them eternity and that they could stay in Jannah. We know that, but how did he do it? What method did he use? Use. That method is important to understand and it's captured in the first expression of the ayah. فَدَلَّ هُمَا بِغُرُورٍ He, dalla is used when you draw a bucket. Like dal in Arabic is a bucket. And adla is to drop a bucket down and pull it right back up. You know in the old times there's a well and you kind of crank up a, uh, the, the water. You know and you pull the bucket back up. This is adla. But dalla is to slowly lower the bucket or to, to put a bucket, you know, for, for a very primitive way of hunting an animal. You have some food like a carrot or something, you put it inside a bucket and it's tied to a rope and the animal comes and you kind of pull it little by little by little by little towards yourself and the animal follows it. This is actually called dalla. Like literally shaitan didn't go out and say disobey Allah. He offered it a little bit, just a small little bit of compromise and they listened and then he offered just a little bit more, it's harmless. What I'm saying isn't haram. I'm just saying just don't take it a little bit easy, you know. And then you don't have to eat from this tree, in the case of our parents. You don't have to eat from, I'm not saying you should eat from the tree. I'm just saying at least check it out. It's a, it's a beautiful tree. There's no harm looking at it, is there? Now look, Allah's commandment was, وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ Don't go near this tree. So the first thing he says, look, at least you're not touching it, okay? At least you're not touching it. Just go near it. It's a good deal. And then when they go near, that, you know what? It's not like you're not supposed to climb it. You're just not supposed to eat from it. Just, just have a little climb. It's no big deal. And it's not at one time. Dalla also suggests that these suggestions came a day, then another day, then another day, then another day. Like this was a process for this guy. It wasn't like they did. He whispered to Adam alayhi salam and immediately he went and ate from the tree. There's actually an entire strategic little by little by little winning over the argument that he's doing. And that's what he does to us to this day. This is the reason it's mentioned in the Quran. That he drew them out with de using this. And the bihurur I didn't translate. Using deception. This is a kind of deception. In other words, there are things that are clearly wrong. You and I know that. There are, there are things that are clearly, clearly wrong. But there are a lot of small, not as clearly wrong steps that are there that you should have the sense to know if I take this one tiny step, Tomorrow I'll be taking another tiny step, and then another, and then another, and before I know it, I'll end up in the wrong. So you have to put protective measures in place. And when you put those protective measures in place, it keeps you from falling into trouble. Now shaitan comes and he talks, he doesn't attack, or he doesn't tell you to make the haram into halal. Oh, that's too, too, too direct. And the Muslim will say, no, it's obviously haram. I'm not gonna do that. He comes and he says, listen, this one little step I'm asking you to take, it's clearly not haram. That's not wrong. You can do that much at least. And it's just one thing after another, after another, after another. SubhanAllah. This is فَدَلَّا هُمَا And by the way, when you're on that road, until you do the wrong, nobody can come out and directly tell you, listen, by the way, this is wrong what you're doing. Because it's not wrong. It's on the road to it. And you, if you don't recognize that you're being pulled slowly but surely towards it, then you only have yourself to blame. The, this is why Allah's commandment to Adam a.s. The advice to Adam a.s. wasn't just don't eat from this tree. The advice was don't go near it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran al-Kareem, Ya ayyuhal nas, kullu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiban, 
وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ All people, Allah is calling upon everyone, not just believers, but Allah is calling everyone, every human being, every man and woman, every single person. Where Allah says, كُلُّ مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ Eat. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sustained you on earth from the halal, from the acceptable and lawful, pure food that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created for you, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُ خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ And do not follow the footsteps of the shaytan. إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُّبِينٌ Verily, he is a clear enemy to you. Then Allah Azza wa Jal describes what the shaytan calls for. إِنَّمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالسُّبُ وَالْفَحْشَاءُ وَانْتَقُولُ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Verily, shaytan calls you, calls you for which is evil and bad. This is what the shaytan calls for. بِالسُّبُ وَالْفَحْشَاءُ it calls for which is bad and evil. And to say on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what you do not know. At the time of Rasulullah, there was a Jewish servant of his who had taken some of his hair and taken some of the teeth of the comb that he was using by the instruction of some of the other people from amongst the Jewish people who had intended to cast a spell on Muhammad. So they took it, they took eleven of these teeth of the comb and they tied his hair and they blew in it and did whatever they wanted to and they, they, they put it in a certain well under a certain rock and it resulted in Rasulullah struggling as a result. Obviously he was a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It did not affect revelation in the sense that nothing wrong happened but this only occurred in order for us as an ummah to learn a lesson how to protect yourself from the devil so people ask sometimes why did this happen to muhammad he was perfect but allah says he was an example for you to follow in order to be an example for you and i to follow allah made him go through certain things that he did not deserve to go through but in order for that to be a lesson for us to say that you as an ummah if you follow him to the t you will be able to achieve the protection from the same devils who tried to harm him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so he could see certain things and it affected him in a certain way and this lasted the whole month and in some according to some narrations a few more months some take it as far as six months and in the interim he was quite ill and sick and Aisha radiallahu anha says one day Allah sent to him two angels one at his feet and one at his blessed head sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the one asks the other, what is wrong with him? So the other says, there is a spell that has been cast on him, which means magic. Matbubun, that's the word used, magic. So the first one says, who did it? So the name comes about, and this is obviously by revelation. The name of the person was Nabid ibn al-A'sam al-Yahudi. And so he says, what did he do? So the other angel answers and he says, he took 11 strands of hair or the hair of Muhammad sallallahu and tied them on 11 of the teeth of the comb and placed them under the rock in a in the pit of a well known as Darwan, Bi'ri Darwan. So what is the solution? In the meantime, verses of the Quran were revealed. Rasulullah sent some of his companions to that well. At the pit of the well, he told them, you will find this, this, this. They found it, they brought it back to him exactly as was described. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed 11 verses, the first surah and then the next surah. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ That is Surah Al-Falaq. And then قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ That is Surah Al-Nas. The total of 11 verses between the two surahs. As he read one verse, he released one knot. He read another verse, he released another knot. By the time he completed all 11 verses, he had released all the knots and he was completely and totally cured. And this was taught to us from that day that if you would like protection from anything superstitious, the devils, the evil eye, no matter what it is, you need to read in advance. Don't wait for something to happen. Read in advance every morning and evening. These two surahs, Falak and Nas, thrice each, morning and evening, no matter what, every single day of your life. And it will result in a metal armor around you. Let me go through the meaning of these beautiful verses because we know the Arabic. Let me go through the English in order for us to appreciate what is being said. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of daybreak from the evil of that which he created and from the evil of darkness when it settles and from the evil of the blowers in knots and from the evil of an envier when he envies. Subhanallah, that's one surah, Surah Al-Falaq. Then we have Surah Al-Nas. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of mankind, the sovereign of mankind, the God of mankind, from the evil of the retreating whisperer who whispers evil into the breasts of man from amongst jinn kind as well as mankind. Subhanallah. 
you add to that what is known as Ayatul Kursi. I'm sure you would know what I'm speaking about. Certain verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to protect us all. So the Prophet Sallallahu gives us very specific examples of how to disarm the shaitan, how to completely take him out of the equation. So he says, for example, when a person enters into their house, if they mention Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and then when they sit down to eat, if they mention Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then shaitan says to his companions, so the devil, the head devil says to the rest of the devils, you have no place to spend the night tonight and you have no food tonight. <laughs> There is no residence for you and there is no meal for you. But the Prophet says, but if he enters into his home without mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shaitan says to his companions, you have found your place to sleep tonight and you have found your dinner for the evening. Rasulullah mentioned that when we become intimate with our spouses, he said, when one of you is about to become intimate, say, Bismillah, Allahumma jannibna shaytan, wa jannib shaytana ma razaqtana, which is in the name of Allah, O oh Allah, protect us from the shaytan and prevent the shaytan from approaching our offspring. SubhanAllah, I mean, you're thinking about this even as you're about to become intimate with your spouse. You talk about being aware of the shaytan's plan and so on and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you make that dua, if you were to have a child as a result of that particular moment or that particular encounter, the Prophet ﷺ says, لا يضره الشيطان, the shaytan would not be able to harm that child. The Prophet ﷺ said about specific, you know, specifically Surah Al-Baqarah, for example. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do not turn your homes into graves. He said, indeed, the shaytan flees from the house that Surah Al-Baqarah is read in. Shaytan would flee from that house. He also said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, particularly mentioning Ayat Al-Kursi, right, in the narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. He also mentioned particularly, he said that whoever recites the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, that that will protect him uh, for the night, that will suffice him for the night, as is narrated by Al-Nu'man ibn al-Bashir. Allah says in the Quran, anytime you feel the whispering of Shaytan, anytime you feel that inclination, فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Seek refuge in Allah, indeed Allah hears and Allah knows and sees. There's a very interesting story of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimullah at the moment of death. So as he was dying, his sons came to him and they said, say the shahada, say la ilaha illallah. This is Imam Ahmad rahimullah. So he started to respond by saying no, no, no. And they did not understand why was he saying no. He fell into unconsciousness and he regained consciousness. When he woke up again, they said, oh father, we told you to say the shahada. Why did you say no? Why did you keep saying no? He said, when you were telling me to say the shahada, Shaitan came to me and he said, you have beaten me. You have succeeded. You have won. Don't worry about me anymore. Don't worry about the shaitan's traps anymore. You have beaten me. And Imam Ahmad knew that this was a trick and a trap. So he said, no, 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 not until I die. And subhanAllah, even till the last moment of your existence, shaitan will try to come to you and deceive you. Even at the moment of death, he will try to pull you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my dear brothers and sisters, be careful. Be careful, be careful with your faith. Protect your shahada, protect your la ilaha illallah. This is only for your benefit and only so you know that shaitan is truly an enemy to you. In Surah Ibrahim, in the middle of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us an amazing incident that is going to occur on judgment day. And this is an incident that our mufassireen and in fact some of the early scholars, they gave a very interesting title to. And the title that is found in some of the classical books of tafsir is Khutbatu al-Shaytan. The khutbah of shaytan. Shaytan is going to give a khutbah, a sermon. And the sermon of shaytan will take place on judgment day or some said right after the judgment finishes and the, they have entered Jahannam. So whether it takes place before or after Jahannam, but it's going to take place in that time frame. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا All of them are going to be standing in front of Allah. فَقَالَ الضُّعَفَاءُ لِلَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا The weak, the majority of mankind that are simply followers will say to the powerful, the mighty, إِنَّا كُنَّا لَكُمْ تَبَعًا we only followed you. You were the ones who told us to do all of these sins, to reject God, to do this and that. We followed you. Can you now help us to be saved fully or partially 
from Allah's punishment. So the masses are going to look to their leaders and the masses will say, look, you were our leaders. We put you in charge and you were the ones who told us to reject Allah, to reject the prophets, to do this and that. So now that you had the izzah in this world, can you now enjoy the izzah of this world in the next? And like we used to respect you and give you our wealth and our whatnot, now can you take our share as well, or at least a portion of our share of Allah's punishment? And of course, we all know the answer. They will say, It's not our fault. We weren't guided. If Allah didn't guide us, then you know, it's not our fault. So they blame it on Allah. Even though in the end, all of mankind is equal when it comes to the intellect, when it comes to the fitra, when it comes to recognizing truth from evil. It is not an excuse if a person tells you to kill somebody, you go kill them. It's not an excuse if a person says, reject God, you reject God. Allah gave you a mind as well. But they try to get off. So they try to lay the blame on the leaders. The leaders say it's not our fault. So then who else are they going to turn to? So when the leaders and the followers don't have anybody else to blame, they turn to shaitan. And they blame Iblis himself. It's all your fault. You did this. If you didn't misguide us, if we didn't follow you, then all of us, the leaders and the followers, wouldn't we be where we are today. And our scholars mentioned that the people will surround Iblis and they will then be blaming Iblis. And so Iblis will stand up, يخطب, give a khutbah. That's why we get the title khutbah to Iblis here, right? And these are all reports from the early scholars. Allah knows how authentic it is and we pray that we never have to see it ourselves. They say that a mimbar, his followers will bring him a mimbar and he will stand up on a mimbar. So all of the people of Jahannam will now be listening to the khutbah of Iblis now. And he will tell them. And Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ now when everything has been finished and the decrees have been passed and the people are seeing the people of Jannah go to Jannah and the people of Jahannam being dragged to Jahannam. So they're seeing the reality of all take place and they're blaming Iblis for all of this. Now, what lies can I say? What can I say now? Inna Allaha wa'adakum wa'ad al you had two promises. You had two versions of events. You had two paradigms in front of you. You had the promise and the version of Allah. And then you had my promise. Now you see which promise is being enacted. You see the people of Jannah going to Jannah. You see the people of Jahannam going to Jahannam. You had these two promises. You could have chosen either one of them. I didn't hide Allah's promise from you. It was there. I gave you my promise. I'm not going to deny. I promised you. Follow me, you shall live a long life. Follow me, you will be happy. Follow me, you will enjoy. And I promised you. And Allah also promised you. The promises of Allah in the Quran. Follow me, you shall enter Jannah. Follow me and live a righteous life. Follow me. The promises were there. So the two promises were in front of you. Now you and I both see. Inna Allah wa'adakum wa'd al haqq The promise of Allah was true. And now Iblis will say, and as for me, I lied. But Iblis will then say, you are surrounding me, you're pointing your fingers at me. Don't blame me, blame yourselves. Why? Why is Iblis saying, don't blame me, blame yourselves? I didn't have any power over you. I did not have any force to force you to disobey Allah. I did not overtake you and then you became like zombies and robots. No. I only had one art and the art of deception, the art of lying, the art of speaking. All that I did was I called you, told you to follow me. And Allah told you to follow him. The two promises were there. You chose to follow me. I did not force you to follow me. And in the end, he will say, "Ma ana bi musrikhikum wa ma antu bi musrikhi." At this stage now, both of us are ending up in the Jahannam. I cannot help you, nor can you help me. And Iblis will also say at the very end, "Inni kafartu bima ashrabtumuni min qabl." And now I cut off all ties with all of the shirk that you used to do with me. I want to make it clear that I have nothing to do with you now. And the, here it's interesting. Inni kafartu bima ashraqtumuni min qabl. I will do kufr with your shirk. That is what he is saying. What does this mean here? I will do kufr means I will reject. I will cut off ties. With your shirk means with your worship of me. Now, did people worship Iblis? 
the worship that they did was to obey him the worship that they did they did was to believe him the worship that they did was to follow whatever iblis wanted them to do i'm going to have to now mind my own business in jahannam and you're going to have to mind your own i can't help you you cannot help me verily the zalimin verily the sinners are now all going to face a painful torment what is the wisdom of allah creating iblis allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy he manifested evil in a personality in an entity if allah azza wa jalla had willed evil would not be in a particular entity the fact that it is an entity it actually makes you more conscious it makes you more aware you know what to fight fight shaitan inna shaitana lakum aduwun allah says shaitan is your enemy fattakhiduhu aduwa take him as your enemy and of them is the wisdom of the story of our father adam and iblis there is a wisdom that our father was seduced by iblis that iblis caused the downfall of our father anybody who harms our family were angry at him anybody who makes fun of our family anybody who brings distress to my father to my mother he becomes an enemy so when the very entity iblis caused our downfall how can we not hate him how can we not despise him there is a wisdom our biological father was harmed by iblis was kicked out of jannah because of iblis how could we not have an animosity it is allah's wisdom that that very entity is alive right now the same iblis not just his descendants the same iblis that did what he did that is our enemy and we have to be careful about taking him as a friend instead of an enemy